welcome one. Welcome all to the politics of cinema. On this show, we believe films are never neutral. There's a political as well as artistic message captured in every film, and we're on the lookout for all of it. My name is Aaron Spears. And my name is Isaac Miller. And on this episode, we're taking a look at George Romero's Knight Rider from 1981. Knight Riders. Knight Riders. Knight Riders. It's plural. There's many of them. And of course, you know, we're doing Romero because we find him interesting, because he's uh, one of the great uh, figures in horror film. We find him interesting as a humanist indie director. But the other thing is, this is a political podcast, and um, he is a consistently, consistently political uh, political director. And, you know, within the zombie genre that he revolutionized, he baked in social commentary from the top. And uh, that makes him a uh, really fair game for this podcast. Oh, for sure. In not in a, not an overt way, really, either. Just like, I, I don't know if it just comes out of his like humanist approach to storytelling or, or how, I don't know, maybe we'll discover that as we're, we're watching and talking here for this month. So uh, this is our first episode in a while we've taken a little break while i was moving uh to southern california uh so this is our first episode where we're not in sh- close proximity and this is also the beginning of our uh halloween month series last year we did um art horror and i think both of us noticed that in many ways you know i mean not noticed this is not a very original thought but that george romero father of the modern zombie film one of the one of the great horror auteurs is a really interesting subject on this stuff, right? Um, basically, that he makes you know like you know small like indie movies about people talking with each other plus people being eaten, right? And and we, I think you said you wanted to explore all of his films, and then we never did it. So, well, it seemed like one of those we'll get around to, and you're like, well, you know, he's known as the. the- father of the zombie film all this all the you know the cultural stuff that he's known for you're like well that's a good october theme yep so we thought what better way to start off though with like his not horror movie <laughs> right his <laughs> his one movie that he hasn't functionally disowned that's not a horror movie um oh it, uh, there's always been has been disowned i don't know if it's i'm not sure if it's disowned but like it's not he's it's not a movie he defends let's put it that way um, I'll probably, so like through the whole month, we're going to be going through multiple his movies, obviously horror movies. We're probably going to avoid the big names. It seems like it's well covered territory. I mean, in general, he's well covered territory, obviously, yeah. but like, yes, I don't think we need anybody else to talk about Dawn of the Dead. Hey, um, did you know how influential Night of the Living Dead was in 68 when it came out and how, it, you know, it's like, yeah, noted. And it'll come up as we talk, I'm sure, but. Right. But I think last year. Last year, we probably won't do it again because we did, we talked extensively about the crazies. And I think the crazies was the one where we like sort of fell in love with him again. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, because I but was also one of those directors that has what I like to call like a manageable filmography that like if I'm going to binge through a filmography of a director, especially like, you know, Romero's filmography, I can do that in a month. Right. Provided I can get access, you know, quickly and easily to 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 the content because um, it's manageable. And it was a director who I was familiar enough with, but then had all these other ones where like when I, you know, mentioned Romero and you were like, Oh, have you ever seen Martin? I was like, Oh no, I haven't. And then a couple other people were like, you've never seen Martin. I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'll get to it. Hang on. Um, But I didn't realize there was that passion out there for some of the ones I hadn't seen of his as well. Yeah. I mean, that's just, I mean, I think Martin is the one that I hear the most come up in that context. I mean, people like creep show. I'm sure there's people who like monkey shines, you know, but like for me, at least, Martin, which we're going to talk about next episode is like, well, I mean, I, I defended season of the witch, which I sort of watched again that year, last year and sort of mm-hmm. didn't feel. So here's, you'll note season of the witch is the same shtick. Same shtick as Martin, is Martin. Is okay. Martin yeah, which we're now talking about more than Knight Rider. We'll talk yeah, about okay. Martin. Next time. <laughs> um, but can we just like restate again? So yes, George Romero is the father of the modern zombie movie, but what else is he? Well, you put me into this one because I, I was, narrowly focused on the stuff that I had seen of his and I re I didn't rewatch. Sorry. I watched day of the dead last October along with mm-hmm. the crazies. Cause you had pointed out to me in day of the dead, something that I really wasn't paying attention to with George Romero. Cause I was like, Oh, he's the zombie guy. Oh, there's the cool gore effects, you know, working with Tom Savini, like breakthrough stuff. It's pretty iconic. And then you pointed out like, no, he makes humanist dramas. Yeah. That's what he does. He makes humanist dramas. 
He makes character pieces. Character pieces, yeah. Especially like ensemble character pieces at that. Or not necessarily ensemble, but like the dynamics that you can get within a small group of people. Most of Dawn of the Dead is like them having dinner and trying to figure out where things are. I mean, most of Night of the Living Dead is not zombies. Yes. I mean, I think Night of the Living Dead is more aggressively you're dealing with this, whereas like, like Night of the Living Dead, you know, or De- Dawn of the Dead is like much more like, I mean, you literally just have large stretches where you don't even see one. Right. Um, and then, and then Day of the Dead, you know, I, in some ways has some of my favorite dialogue of any of these movies, because it really is just like them, like contemplating over the end of the world. It's pretty existential stuff. There's like army. I think the, the scene you point out to me was like, there's guys in the army, I think just like playing cards and like, Oh, so the end of the world, huh? It's kind of boring <laughs> or whatever. Like I was like, Holy cow. Like I, it, my antenna just wasn't ready for those things until you kind of pointed it out. And then watching crazies, watching Dawn of the dead, De- ah, watching day of the dead. I was like, Holy shit, you're right. Like the most fascinating things here are the interpersonal relationships and dynamics. And then it just so happens that there's an apocalypse going on outside. I mean, there's some really killer effects there. So, but basically, right, we're looking at him as as a humanist auteur, but one who's always done it through horror movies, except for, I mean, there is another example, but Knight Riders are special in this, is that this is a, get, a chance where he gets to do this sort of shtick, but without horror elements to help him in a mm-hmm. metaphorical sense. And, well, does it work is, is a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting. Can we just say something about the background of this? So this is uh, 81. This is after... After uh, Dawn of the Dead, which is a huge movie, right? Like where he's, you know, if he, he, you know, where he cemented his place, right? Through the seventies, he's got multiple movies. So he's got a. Who's he working with here? What's the What's the deal? For Night Riders. Yeah. This is a. It's interesting. I mean, it's like you know, he gets the band back together. Like he's got a core group that he likes to work with, um, including his wife. I believe they were married at this time. I don't remember the personal timeline here. Uh, I mean, he's his own writer, producer, director, uh, or no, I'm sorry, not producer. Uh, he's his own writer, director, editor, which I think is, um, which is really, really interesting. I, I, I'm fascinated by, by, uh, writer directors that also do their own editing. So, and you know, you've got Tom Savini in there and, uh, so he's obviously worked with Tom Savini through the years by this point. Uh, but then you also have the, the first major starring role for Ed Harris. Is this his really his first major starring role? I think, yeah, I, I, one of the reviews I read, um, Ann Thompson did a uh, look back because she visited the set of Knight Riders um, and she wrote an article about it when Romero passed away a few years back. And she got a, she got an interview with Ed Harris in the article and he mentions how, like, you know, it was my first, you know, lead role. I was like, damn. I He, he does it. He does it. And um, I mean, we, we talk about performances later, but um, yeah, it's 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 clearly a passion project from what I've read. uh Romero's intent was to make a down and dirty, gritty, like medieval, like Arthurian legend movie where like, but, you know, gritty and dirty the way, you know, it it would be um, in in that particular time period in that era. And then uh, due to budget constraints, like, well, this isn't quite going to work out, I guess, after all. Um, And he had um, fell in with or or came across this medieval hobbyist group called the Society for Creative Anachronism. And that kind of inspired him to be like, wait a minute, what if, what if, what if the horses were motorcycles, you know, or, and so like it kind of adapted as, as it went. But um, I think I put in my notes that this movie is a hard sell and I, it's clearly a personal project that he really wanted to make, which is interesting because he's also a director who his whole filmography is, He's not doing like, I'm going to go make a Hollywood movie now. His whole filmography seems to be, and again, we're, I'm coming at this from like, I'm not a, uh, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Romero, but I'm not one of those, like, I know everything about his filmography. We're just kind of coming in um, as fans and uh, appreciating his work here. So, well, part of actually, I just sort of just to situate this. I mean, so this is, I was saying this after Dawn, you're talking about sort of the, the content of where it is for him artistically. Part of what it is is that he's got a three-picture deal with Laurel Entertainment Inc., which is, uh, you know, which is like a at this point, right? He's, he, he inks this out in like 1980, mm-hmm. and so obviously his budgets aren't huge, but this is actually more than he's dealt with. 
And I know I was I was watching, you know, the documentary on the Day of the Dead before this. And one of the things they point out is that so he's got this deal to do this. One part of the deal is that he has to make a dead movie. That's why Day of the Dead happens. But he decides to do his passion project first, which, sure. as we said, is a hard sell. This movie is weird and does not do well. And so one of the things people are pointing out, and you know, that was pointed out in the doc- documentary is like, um, this is like, you know, the making of the Day of the Dead. It's on YouTube if anybody wants to find it. It's it's, it's pretty easy. Um, but basically, he probably could have gotten a bigger d- budget for Night Riders if he did the Dead movie first because that would have been more of a hit. Mind you, oh, sure. Day of the Dead wasn't a massive hit either. But like, so it, it was sort of a bad positioning. And I was saying to you before this started, this feels, this is, may not be accurate, but this feels a little bit like his um, John Carpenter phase um, because he's trying to reach for something bigger after his, um, oh, and he, I don't even think he did Creepshow before De- uh, Dead 2. And like Creepshow, Cre- Creepshow does well, but it's not like, yeah. you know, but basically he's, he's, he's trying to go, it's, he's trying to go a little bit more mainstream with this as much as he could. I mean, this is a guy who basically operates out of Pittsburgh with the same crew. He is an indie director's director in a lot of ways. Right. Um, through and through. He's trying for something a little more and like with Carpenter, but Carpenter does this for like most of his career. Um, doesn't really work. Trying to get some more like a mainstream level funding just doesn't really work. Um, I don't know if I'm reading the situation correctly, but I think that's sort of what's going on. That seems to be the way I was. I, like, I was just sort of amazed at like that this movie even exists for one was, was kind yeah. of interesting, but the fact that he is, he's doing what he wants to do again, there's like some budget constraints. So it didn't end up being, you know, the, the first thing he imagined, but the guy can roll with, with punches and can roll with setbacks like with the best of them. Right. He's, he's and, a real, he's a real indie director. Right. Right. And so what I mean by the hard sell is first, if you, are unfamiliar with the movie. Like I mentioned a few people I work with that, um, they're like, Oh, you know what? You know, I'm the movie guy. So like, Oh, what'd you watch? We're like, watch this crazy George Romero movie. Like, Oh, one of the zombie ones. Like, no, it's one about these medieval knights that live by this Arthurian legend kind of code of honor, but they ride motorcycles and they make their own. And they're like, Oh, like LARPers. And I was like, well, it, there's an element of live action role playing, but like, they're really into it. Like it's different than that. It's more than that. Um, like it's, it's a lifestyle choice. Like this is what they do. And they're like, what? then I show them a pic, uh, the poster. And you're like, I know IMDb go there. Like this dude on a motorcycle with the, the plume up top. I was like, yeah, actually that's Ed Harris. Um, he's the leader. <laughs> and you start describing it to them. And they're like, wait, what, what the fuck is this about? Um, <laughs> and you're like, well, it's like a modern day Renaissance troupe. And they're just like, I, what makes you want to watch this? And I was like, yeah, I know. None of that makes you want to watch this movie. Oh, also it's a uh, 145 minutes long. <laughs> right. It'll be, it, it'll be like nearly two and a half hours. Also. So yeah, right. It's I a think hard that's, sell. It's a hard sell. And part of it is what it, so what we were talking about him being basically a humanist indie director, this is the movie where he just gets to do nothing but that. Right. right? right. It's primarily them dialogue, them having drama, interpersonal, actually very well drawn characters, right? Like I, I think a lot of yeah. the dialogue is extremely clunky, but basically the conflict is over one. There is a real question as to how mentally ill, frankly, uh, Ed Harris's character is, right? Like he is not actually okay. And he keeps driving things to the next level. He he lives by this code. And it's not really clear. There's basically a conflict because Tom Savini is like the hot, like hot dogger guy knight who basically, I mean, the way their troop works, like this is an interesting combination of Renfair, mm-hmm. like almost carny stuff, right? Combined with like hippie commune culture. Yeah. I mean, that's because they're literally like, this is an alternative lifestyle. This is what you live. You said you're going to do this. They have councils, like there's formal ways of running things. And Ed Harris is the king. And if his side loses in one of the jousts, then the person leading the other side becomes it. And that would be Savini, Mm -hmm. who basically through a lot of it is frustrated and angry and wants to show his full potential. But like what we find out, you know, you find out pretty early, I mean, he's a womanizer uh, because I guess Tom Savini's hot, I guess. And, but like basically that he wants, he wants to sell out, but part of it is, is because of his own life is like, basically like all he's good at motorcycles. He's a working class. He's, you know, he was a working class kid and like, he wants to go all the way. And there's a conflict within this community, basically about selling out Mm -hmm. with Ed Harris being like, not okay. So, 
But all these characters are extremely well drawn. The dynamic is very believable. It just for me, the dialogue is really clunky. Yeah, it I it didn't really hit my ears quite as clunky as it, I think it it was for you. Um, because mm. I I think having Ed Harris at the helm um really, really helps this one. Yes. It obviously first main starring role for him there, but I don't know, Ed Harris is really good at the um uh, commitment to one's ideal. I mean, later in his career, you know, he does like, he does Pollock, he, even like, even something as um, seemingly trite as like a Truman show or something like, it's still like, he's, he's a, uh, he's good at, at, at performing care or he's good at bringing characters to life that are like committed to their artistic integrity or their ideals. And I think he sells it here. Like he is committed. There's one, there's even one scene where they're talking about um, selling out versus their principles. And he ends the scene by screaming, I'm fighting the dragon here. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I'm officially I'm laughing in my basement watching this on with my projector. But at the same time, I was like, he sells that. Yes. And I buy it. But it's like when you show someone the poster and the description, you're like, it's inherently kind of goofy. Yes. But everyone on board is committed to the bit. So it's, that helps. Com- it's completely played straight. It could not be played straighter. That's what it is, yeah. This would be an interesting companion piece. Ooh, ooh wait, wait. The, the, the. Our patented Isaac crazy double feature. Is this what you're going for here? Yeah, it's not going to work, though. Um, oh. <laughs> I didn't mean to build I, up that. I, I was going to go with Return of the Sakaka 7 or something. Because I'm thinking about detritus of the 60s in a certain sense, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they don't make reference to it. It's not that exactly. And some of the people here are probably a little bit too young to directly. To, well, but no, like, you know, we're like, if this is in 1980 or even 1979, like, you know, we're about a year out. Or, you know, it's the same time period of sort of like the counterculture is lost yeah. and you're trying to hold on to these beliefs and you're trying to hold on to the system. It's just, they're totally apolitical, right? Like I'm not saying the return of the Zakaka seven is about peripheral activists. It's actually about a strata that people who aren't part of movements would really know. Right. Um, because they're not the core organizers of anything. Um, but they showed up to stuff and they have the politics. This is not about people like that at all. It has nothing to do with politics other than sort of like, trying in a certain i mean it's actually the stuff that like hardcore activists and, and people or you know don't like which is like trying to create like alternative lifestyle that doesn't have any political effect on the rest of the world because it's just for you which is actually what they're doing yeah but at the same time it's very much still about dealing with um i mean you could watch this with mandy <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking um, now we're talking, no, Skaga seven is actually pretty good too. Cause well, cause I wrote that down. One of the things I was on the lookout for and am on the lookout for as we're going through these, these Romero films is not just what you pointed out a year ago about the humanist quality of these. And like, he's really good at basically like a uh, intense, um, like four or five character, uh, chamber drama. Like he, mm-hmm. he can write these really, really well. Um, mm-hmm. I, I do tend to agree with you though. Yes, it does work when it's heightened by an apocalypse happening around the characters, um, in this case, it's it's the stakes aren't quite that high. So I think that, you know, maybe is where the, like the clunkiness comes in because you're not distracted by like, oh, somebody just got their neck, ch- you know, bitten off or something. But the other thing that Romero does, I think, pretty spectacularly is is like the ease of a metaphor in the story he's working with, because like you can go through all the zombie ones and I, we're going to end up having to talk about those. So we'll talk about it at the time. But like the whole idea of like Dawn of the Dead, it's in a shopping mall, zombies, consumer like there. It's critique of of, of modern culture within the zombie story you know the crazies has its own thing going on and so i was on the lookout for it in this one and i wrote down what you were just talking about it it felt this is 81 and this felt much more interestingly not not i don't find his films to be reactionary i commenting on or like the, the easy metaphor going on here was yeah it was like the lament of like this is a counterculture they're trying to operate within mainstream society and they actually have this opportunity to go do like a vegas style show and make a solid living doing what they love, but that's corrupting the counterculture and the lifestyle they've developed for themselves. The the made up authorian like right. standards that they've done to, and part of it is the other reason you bring up Mandy. Honestly, it's a th- it's a triple bill. It's a triple bill because the thing is this: are they a cult? They're not a cult, but they're actually not that far off. Right. Like they're not actually like they're actually a business operation, even though they don't really. But they, I mean, it's, they, they have to live. And so they live by entertaining people. And, it you know, the contradictions of what they do were like they're sort of a, a, in many ways a loving family. 
of people who deeply care about each other at the same time that like the way they make their living is through direct combat. Mm -hmm. And as the tensions within, I mean, one of the really, I think one of the most impressive scenes is when all the tensions have come, you know, everything's flying apart. Right. And all these emotional dynamics are sort of spiraling out of control. And you're seeing that in the, the combat by motorcycle, whereas it should be, yes, this stuff can be dangerous and the tensions play out, but like everybody's basically supposed to be safe. You know, you get knocked off a motorcycle, but you're well padded. It's mm -hmm. getting really bad. Yeah. And actually, you know, like one of the spectators gets seriously injured. And it's so like you, you see that uh, played out there. I don't know. So I this is what's crazy about this is until you pointed out and this is um, but, you know, like part of his Romero is a political director consistently throughout his career. Mm -hmm. And um. So, the, you know, when you put this in the context of that, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, it's in some ways is one of his less political films, but it's certainly dealing with a lot of the same, uh, with adjacent political themes. Does that make sense? You know, it absolutely does. Um, Cause it's not, he's not a political filmmaker the way you'd think of, I was just thinking of also in the eighties, like uh, the way Oliver Stone hits the scene, you know, with like platoon and stuff. Like that's, it's not that kind of level. Actually, I think the most political thing with this movie is how it didn't connect with an audience. <laughs> because of the themes we were just talking about with like the counterculture and, and alternative uh, like lifestyle that they've got set up for themselves within the story. This is also like the year that Reagan comes into power. Right. And it's also the year that what is celebrated at the box office is Indiana Jones and Excalibur. So the fact that this doesn't connect, like if you just shift this movie back like four years, I think there's potential for it to connect in a way like this is, this feels more like a new Hollywood, like personal auteur driven film. Right. Than an early eighties movie. He's running right into it. I yeah. mean, we can continue with the Secaucus seven comparison, which is that, you know, he's, you know, it's Secaucus says that seven is like, is a, a time capsule of a moment that was literally just about to end, but the, both the people who made the movie and the actors don't know that. Right. Like it's, it's, this movie is a time capsule, but in some ways it's sitting more on the edge because the sellout themes are there, right? The option is there. The greed is good is, is potentially there, but you know, it's not made oh, with that. Right. Mind. Right. Um, Cause we were joking uh, that like, you know, the whole, the sellout vibe here, um, which actually is extra hilarious. Cause the guy playing, the guy that's trying to like get them to sell out is, um, Martin Ferrero, who's the guy who is uh, in Jurassic Park, trying to get like the park to go, like we're gonna make a fortune with this this park who gets eaten on the toilet by the T Rex. I mean, does he just spe specialize in being huckster creeps? It does. It seems like it, right? Um, no, this is like an early role for him. I looked him up and I was like, oh my god, this is like how he started out. So like, maybe he just got. Uh, he's like, I can do this one thing. He's been typecast. Yeah, uh, we're gonna look up his filmography, and there's some like brilliant stuff in there that is not him being this, and it's gonna be awkward, but. Did you have more on this? I'm sorry. Not really specifically on that one, but I mean, okay. So actually a little bit in the holes, it, like if you just shift this movie back, let's shift this movie back 10 years and it comes out in 71. Cause Romero was a director by then. He could have had this story in his head. And um, I also actually read a couple of things where like, um, actually after the Ed Harris comments in the Ann Thompson interview, I looked up some Ed Harris interviews where he talked about working with uh, Romero. And he was said that, you know, he, he knew him throughout his career and he uh, felt bad because he had like all these great script ideas and some scripts that he wrote that just never got produced because they weren't horror. And I was yeah. like, Fuck, I want to read some of those scripts. What was he working on that could have been right? Be kind of interesting. But if we shift this back to like, say, 71, um, we spent uh, we spent a bit of time. We spent a lot of time, actually, uh, summer of 2020 going through the 1960s year by year. And we talked a lot about biker films. And how yeah. many Nazis there are in biker films back in the and, late 60s, early 70s. Kind of and a Nazi actually shows up in this one and they kick the shit out of they him. They kick the shit out of him, yeah. And uh, the, great. The, 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 the lesbian knight chases him down and humiliates him. Yeah, I even wrote it down here that um, she even says something about she schools him on like the uh, the 101s or whatever whatever they called it. Like your fundamentals. Right. Yeah, it was just it was nice that like they popped up. I was like, oh my God, he's even addressing the whole like Nazi contingent within like the biking community. That's pretty fun. And pretty overtly political. The other thing that's very overtly political, actually, in this movie is the, um, the very strong ACAB vibes anytime a cop shows up. Oh, yeah. Because uh, the cops are the worst. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it just as one example of that. Here's a clip. Uh, this is a, so 
the very fir- the first scene is 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 the cops fucking with him, and they're not right. going to pay him off. And Aaron's like, no, we're not paying this guy off. He clearly just wants to be paid off so they can set up their shop or set up their their village and do the whole performance, you know, out here in the in the, in the sticks. And then halfway through, because he didn't get paid off, he comes back and um, the cop comes back. The cop comes back. Yeah, thank you. And um, goes to arrest one of the troop. And Ed Harris is like, no, I'm going to jail with him. Uh, Well, here's the clip. As you may remember from our uh, earlier conversations, I am a reasonable man. I'm sure we can reach a uh, informal bail arrangement for your boy here. You again. I told you to pay this guy off the last time. Now, I bet your price just went up, huh? And I said, we're not paying. And we're not paying this rat pile heap of dog shit a goddamn cent. Do you want to take him in? Take me in, too. Oh, that's real sweet. We'll all go together. Merle, go get Steve. We ain't paying off on no frame. Bagman ain't going to no jail alone. We got a show to do in three days. We do have to get there. Maybe we can't make it. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. We haven't got enough problems as it is. I do think you boys ought to reconsider. Small town jails is uh, uncomfortable places. <clears throat> Damn uncomfortable. All them lead pipes and stuff. Bag man ain't going to no jail alone. Anything happens in that jail, there's going to be a witness. The rest of you stay here until we get out. Now, are you going to arrest me, fat man? Or do I have to do something to provoke you? All right, Jack, you've got it. So it's pretty clear, like, Ed Harris is in control, knows what he's doing, and also he's putting his, uh, I don't know what you call it, his honor, what his ideals on the line here. Like, he's willing to go to jail um, because, you know, they're a family. They're going to so stick together on this. I'm actually going to disagree with you here. He doesn't know what he's doing, and that's part of the problem is – this is one of the precipitating incidents for the troop to start falling apart, along with him going out into the field when he's not in great shape and getting injured mm-hmm. and then continuing to do things. Part of the problem, part of what's driving the group apart is Ed Harris, like all of them, not all of them actually, but like most of them have bought into this philosophy. Yeah. He holds them together. He holds them as the group. Um, But the problem is, is he's losing it. He's doing it too far. So like, in this situation, right, like Tom Savini is basically, let's just keep going. We have to keep moving and he will not bend. And this is a precipitating incident. Well, it's not just that. He basically says, I'm going to go get arrested. Don't leave without me. Like the troop has another gig. Right. And he's right. saying he cannot go. And basically his his girlfriend, uh, who's the queen and all this, basically, as soon as he's gone, said, all right, you know, you go get him out. Pack it up. And everybody else pack it up. Yeah. And we're going to, you know, it's like the the practical thing. So part of what's tearing them apart is he is so fanatical in this that he cannot bend in the slightest. And because Ed Harris is a great director, you can see the cogs going in his brain as he's making these decisions. Like you can see him turning it over in his head. Like, should I, should I go with what they're saying and bend a little bit? No, I can't bend any. And it, it nearly tears the group apart. I get what you're saying. I still think it's, I don't, I think Ed Harris knows what he's doing and I, I'm wording it that way because he, and he, for him, it's an act of keeping people together and like, right. Hey, we're all in this together. If you're going to jail, I'm going to jail. And even tells the cop, like, would I have to punch you or, you know, what I had to do to go to jail right now. Right. So he's not doing think, it as an act of like, this is all going to fall apart. It's an act of like, no, we're going to keep this together. And you know, it's. I, I think the problem is he doesn't idea. understand. He's unable to bend to understand how far the dynamics have gotten in within the group. Right, right, right. right. He's, 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 he's throwing accelerant on them, not so much about getting their guy out of jail, but by like, you know, being unwavering at every level. Right. And you have Savini in the background. It's like, just pay the guy. He just wants a, you know, he just wants a payoff. He just wants a payoff. We need to get out of here. We've got another gig. Also, we can make sure none of us get out of jail. I mean, like, look, part of it is the guy who ends up in jail with him gets the shit kicked out of him. Mm -hmm. And it's like you're looking at a certain part of the day. You know, Ed Harris is like screaming while this is going on. But in fact, in a certain I mean, it's not his fault. It's the cop's fault. Obviously, nobody's fault but the cops when the cops beat somebody up. But this is in part based on his decision to be uh, unbending and people under him gets hurt, get hurt. But I would note too the guy that gets injured there, and I don't remember the character name. I didn't write it down. Um, they have a little campfire powwow later on when they're going to catch up with the rest of the troop out of the jail, 
and mm. he's the one who's like, you know, based on Ed Harris's commitment to getting him out of jail and sticking with him so he's not on his own in some random hillbilly jail, mm. um, you know, he's saying like, no, we can't compromise. Right. And I, I think he is saying that, but it, even there, you can see the intensity of Ed Harris. Right. Where you sort of, it's like, is he crazy? I mean, he is. Like, yeah. he's he's really, we're not going to, let's not spoil the end. We will say that that particular cop, if you want to see a cop get beat up to applause. Yeah. If you want an A cab fantasy of a knight beating the crap out of a cop, spoilers, uh, it will happen. Well, it's not the end end, but yeah. No, I put that in my notes, like starts off with an ACAB scene, it ends with an ACAB scene. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And also it's one of those where you're like, you kind of forget about that cop character because it's fucking two and a half hours long. Right. And by the time yeah. you end, you're like, where's he going to this diner for? What's he going to be like? Oh, he's going to get that cop. And then you start clapping because it's- Because he said he would. He yeah. said he would. Commitment um, I mean, to his ideals. All right. Forget it. If you don't, if you haven't seen the movie yet, we'll, we're going to keep talking. We'll probably talk about the end. But like, you know, part of what's going on, I mean, like part of it is- so, you know, Tom Savini's character takes the majority of their nights and goes to sell out. Mm -hmm. And part of it is when they get out of that context, the nights start being totally self-destructive. They start fighting with each other. They, they're unable to handle it. And then sort of the ch Ed Harris is champion among the nights gets driven away by Ed Harris because he will not allow, you know, Harris is endangering himself by going out into the field. He's already injured. And he leaves as well, right? Because, you know, basically uh, his mentor attacks him on the right. field. I mean, it's... it's the family is, is breaking up. The family is breaking up. And a lot of it is being driven by what he holds them together. The contradiction is Ed Harris's principles and things that will keep them together, but his rigidity tears them apart. Mm -hmm. Along with sort of the pull of Tom Savini being, you know, in a lot of ways, sort of another alpha figure. But what's interesting is I mean this is part of the the how well set up the character dynamics are is you actually when you take when you take the knights out of the context you find out why the knights are actually part of this or this group in the first place when you take them out of it when they right. try to sell out these are not people who are actually able to function in the world they right. get corrupted really quickly and they just start like smashing up the room like you know their hotel room like um like rock stars, except they're fighting with each other. It's funny you say rock stars. I wrote in my, my, my notes when I was watching, it was like, they're fighting like, what did I write? Like they're fighting like uh high school, like alpha high school athletes who just got drunk for the first time. Yeah. Like they're just trashing the hotel room. And then the comical, part, again, this, I don't, Romero is amazing. So you have that scene, they're trashing a hotel room. And then the, the, you see it, uh, the camera kind of moves away and you see Tom Savini, he's just sitting outside and he's, he's just, he's petting a daisy. <laughs> like it, it's like this weird like it's officially like that's comedic but like it's right. so it's so heartfelt you're like oh yeah he, he just he misses a simpler time he's just you know i and i would totally buy it if tom savini was in there just trash in a hotel room but part yeah but part of it is he 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 goes he sees this this is part of why savini's arc is actually so good in this mm -hmm. is that through a lot of this we've seen him as fairly uncaring he's willing to hurt people he's not good to his to his 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 kind of girlfriend he's he's he wants to sell out now out of that context you see without that home base that he thought that he wanted mm -hmm. you know so the woman who's sort of you know who's part of the showbiz group who sort of he starts an affair with turns out she is a partner and he'd just be like somebody he, he, she fucks and that's not really enough for him which is turning the tables on him frankly because that's how he treats the, right. the woman he's it's with him. It is him, actually. Yeah. Yeah. He's facing up to his own behavior to a certain degree um, by being treated the same way because he's gotten into space where he is just the entertainment. And then also, yeah, like you, you, you see why he needed this system to function and why this community, this, this outside alternative co counterculture helped him. So they ride on back. You know, the the good knight decides to go back. Everybody goes back. They fight again. He becomes king. Um, Basically, Ed Harris loses everything in a sense, but but not, not his own terms in the in the world that he's created. In the world that he's created, totally on his own terms, it doesn't yeah. just it doesn't destroy him. I mean, he does. Let, let's be clear: he goes, beats the hell out of the cop, and then gets hit by a semi truck. Yeah. Um, but part of it is, in some ways, his mission was accomplished by reproducing the society that he created. 
Right. And it will continue. And there's a new king and who, who now has been anchored into its values. Yeah. So is Romero working in a different realm of metaphor here? Uh, is this maybe a comment on filmmaking? Before we get to that, which is uh, yes. Um, <laughs> okay. Question solved or question answered. Can we, uh, can we talk about Merlin for a second and then we'll talk about the mystical end of it. And then we'll talk about sure. maybe some, maybe weird racial politics, but I'm not sure. But who, who, who plays the Merlin in this court? Merlin in this case is played by, um, I'll use his performer name because that's what he he's performing here. It's uh, brother blue who I was only peripherally aware of as like a performance artist, um, I think I had like hippie for some reason in my head from Cleveland and we're from Cleveland. So, well, one of us is still in Cleveland. My heart's in Cleveland. Right. So um, Brother Blue is a really interesting performance artist, storyteller, multi-hyphenate um, actor, obviously he's in this one and educator as well. Um, I recommend looking up his biography. It's really, really fascinating. He served in uh, World War II in a segregated unit of the army. Uh, he went on to get his BA from Harvard. He ended up, go anyway, blah, 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 blah. He went and he has a PhD in divinity with pastoral sacred storytelling. And so in order to get that uh, that PhD, he delivered his, I, Isaac, as a, as a PhD candidate here, uh, maybe you could do some work like this uh, when you're done working on your PhD. Deliver your doctoral presentation at Boston's Deer Island Prison, accompanied by a 25-piece jazz orchestra. What a badass. The video recording of that was what was turned into the dissertation committee for further consideration. That is amazing. And yeah, wow. That is, that is so cool. Anyway, he's sort of like the spiritual guide here, in a sense. Or that, well, he's 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 a spiritual anchor. So part of it is you see like him and Ed Harris as sort of the combined, well, they are the state and religion in this community. True. And sort of the, you know, the the person providing some meat and uh, mystical meat and bones on the, on the um, or meat on the bones that Ed Harris is providing. Um, so basically there is, part of what's going on with Harris is he's, I don't totally understand the deal with the blackbird. Um, oh, I, okay. This is terrible. Cause I don't have the details here. I looked that up. I think that has that something actually to do with like the, the legend of King Arthur. Oh, I think it's okay. in the actual like legend there. So he was writing that into like, you know, Hey, this is, this is part of that. Um, it's part sorry, of I don't that. have the detail on that one, but. Cause Ed Harris is having a dream about a blackbird. Yeah. That one of the rides when he's heavily injured and should not go out when this is actually when things really fall apart, somebody shows up with a black bird on their armor because part of it is at the end of each show, they let people go in like with motorcycles and like play around and basically like play at being nice, which just seems extraordinarily dangerous. This is when Nazis show up and you have to like beat them up. Mm -hmm. Like, um, but you know, it just ends up sort of zoo like, um, but the guy who show he, he, he fights the black, you know, the sort of night with the black bird on it who showed up um, in our theory legend, the blackbird represents doom. Yeah. So this is like his, this is his, Oh, well that explains a lot. So, um, Cause it's even there in the first scene, isn't it? When uh, he wakes up Ed Harris wakes up by the river and you don't know it's a modern tale yet. He wakes up and he's kind of like, um, what do you call it? Like flagellating himself in the, in the river. Yeah. With the whip. And then he gets dressed and then he's on a motorcycle. Like, Oh crap. I thought this was going to be a medieval set thing, but turns out it's modern. It's Surprise. Yeah. Okay. So that really explains a lot there. So this is representing his doom and it actually is his doom, but what it actually is, is a clearly, um, you know, indigenous, like native, uh, like teenager who's part of it is, is that Ed Harris is like known, right? Like this is what, part of what, you know, they, they're part of like the motorcycle circuit, right? Like these are known people. They have a certain degree of celebrity. Um, and like, there's actually literally a kid. Oh, that's the other, well, you know, there's literally a kid who, like, he shows up in a, Ed Harris's character is in a magazine, and this kid idolizes him and wants a signature. And he's like, "I'm not evil, can evil, I can't do that. Like, I shouldn't have been in this magazine. I didn't get thing." Right, it's not pure mission, but clearly, this is like a fan. Yeah, but actually, so he knights he knights this kid, and the kid follows him everywhere he goes, and then eventually, he you know dies, um, or he's is killed by a semi after completing his last tasks. Mm -hmm. So basically like the, the blackbird of death follows him everywhere. 
there are probably not the best idea to have a native character like a, a metaphorical spirit animal at this point. But nonetheless, they do it. He's also actually a character in the movie yeah. and does do things. It you know it's it's there. It, it's all another bit of the hippieishness of it. Um, because the other thing that he does at the end of the movie is he goes and and gives the kid the kid who at the beginning he like. Well, part of it is he comes to a realization that you can both have fans and not be an asshole about it. Right, right. So he goes to the kid's school and like gives him a sword, which is an extremely bad idea. Um, it's also another one of those like this is a inherently weird, if not comical, scene. It's totally comical. Like, it's he literally just shows up at the school, walks in. The teacher is not like, "Who are you? Uh, what's going on?" Calling for a principal, another teacher from across the hallway. Hey, there's a crazy guy with a sword in my classroom. Like, there's a reaction you should have to this scene. Well, she's she's totally taken aback. I get it. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. Like, it's inherently just like, what the fuck? But like, you know, it it works. Harris sells it. The kid buy like, yeah, it's really weird, though, but it works. It does work. Ultimately, <laughs> I know you uh, don't like the phrase, so I don't know what else to use for this. But I, I did write down a few things uh, in the woke notes category for this movie because it is 1981 and the Nazi thing first showed up and I was like, Okay, wait, is anti-Nazi stands, is that progressive for 81? No, that's just how fucked up 2021 is, that that feels progressive that they're putting down Nazis in this movie. So, admittedly, as you point out repeatedly, you have an entire genre of film right. in which people want, wear Nazi paraphernalia and don't get the shit kicked out of them. Right. Uh, it's biker movies. Biker in the movies, 60s. yeah. So, like, actually... Mm, yeah. So, I mean, part, I, I think it is, he is making a point there, right? He, he is, is, he is. He is having like a queer biker beat the crap out of a Nazi. Um, at one point, uh, the female knight, like she even grabs the young knight and kisses him. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a Pip, the whole character of Pip. There's a conversation with his amongst his family, very supportive uh, group of folks there that are like, "Are you gay?" And he's like, "I don't know, I don't." And he's very sincere about it. Like it's just someone who has not discovered their sexuality yet. Well, um, probably because the society at large around him wasn't you know, making him feel comfortable enough. And he does find, uh, at least, you know, first love, uh, literally on the air while he's broadcasting an event, um, with a fellow member of the troupe. So it actually, the progressive bona fides of the movie is actually more than that, because what happens is the person asking him this, this is like exactly what you don't do with somebody who's queer and has not come out yet is you do not force them into it publicly amongst a group amongst a group. Right. You don't do that. And so this is his uh, best friend, who's, who's a woman, who's the person who's dating Tom Savini, and she totally does that, and he's pissed off, and she is wrong, and they have a conversation about it, they work it out, right. and they're friends. It's very impressive work for, for yeah, yeah, it's very impressive work for like 1980, 1980. yeah, like it's they. Also, it, it gets it all right. Yeah, no, it's, it's it is because it, it gives it an also an arc to it. The whole his whole character is not just a one off scene to get a quick bit of drama or, um, you know, conflict going there. But also it's not like she's asking him I and mean, she's asking him amongst friends as well. Like it's amongst their troop. She is, but she's I, doing. It. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But it, but that's just it. but part of it is all the nuances are there, right? All the nuances yeah. of the situation, why she's doing it in that context. Everything is like. It's really well done. It's also post uh, post performance. So like they I, I don't remember the scene exactly, but like they may have just been sitting around drinking. They're around a campfire. Like it may have just been one of those things like, oh, man, I, I I was drinking. I wasn't really thinking, Pip. I'm sorry. You know, like it could have been that that sort of um, environment to it as well. Well, but part of it is what they end up what it does is allow them to push forward their relationship on screen on screen because right. right. then he can confront her about the stuff that she's screwing up because she doesn't have a lot of self-esteem, which is why you're going out with Tom Savini. Um, and while he yeah. treats her like crap, like you get to work through all of this stuff. There's multiple queer characters. There's people who could potentially be, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's really interesting. Yeah. It's almost like he's a really great humanist director who has great powers of observation of the culture at large and isn't, you know, an asshole. Yes. Yes. I would, I would actually say that, uh, are, I think we're actually, now that we've talked about it, liking this movie more than when we got on. I think so too. Uh, but we also, we were saving our conversation until we were, you know, recording so that I wasn't really sure where we were going to go or how it was going to turn out. But we did sort of joke ahead of time that I feel like I didn't have a strong, like, oh, this needs to be like a four star or five star movie. 
but I was like, I think this is why on letterbox, like that, that heart was invented. Cause I was like, this isn't even an amazing movie within George Romero's filmography. I think it's a very good movie. And I would, if I could, and hopefully this, you know, whatever, 45 minutes or so of this episode is convincing enough. Like this sounds interesting. I want to check it out. Cause I don't know how you sell this quickly to somebody, but it has a lot of heart. I, I do kind of adore it for what it's trying to do and what it's doing. It's swinging for the fences, even if it's a little clunky. And I think there's a lot to it. That's worth, um, worth recommending that people watch it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a weird, it's a weird ass movie, <laughs> but also, you know, yeah. Like Romero, Romero has it where it counts. There's clunkiness. There's there's things that may not totally hold together, but Romero totally has it where it counts. And I think his strengths, I think he really, this does show that he is best when he has a horror metaphor and context to help him to channel these elements of what he does. Mm -hmm. But it shows his, it, it shows, it shows probably, I mean, yes, there's a lot of movies he wanted to make that weren't horror movies and he did get a pigeonholed in there. And maybe he would have made some even better just straight dramas than this if he'd had the chance. I think it's very likely, but it, it, it does show his strengths and why we're focusing on him this month where, and we're starting why we're starting our Halloween coverage uh, with a non-horror movie. Right. I mean, they're still in costume, so it kind of counts for Halloween. I, right. You, I you can, you can dress as Ed Harris being obsessively King Arthurian, <laughs> and ride your, I don't know, kids around on the motorcycle to trick or treat or something, but <laughs> wrap it up. Like the last, the last point I wanted to make sure I hit specifically on this film is Romero. Even if there's clunkiness involved here, the man can structure a fucking story. Mm -hmm. This movie, you, you can go into this movie knowing nothing about it like you maybe know the poster like is that a, a somebody dressed as a knight on a motorcycle and it doesn't matter he gives you an introduction to all of the characters which is i don't know let's say like at least eight to ten probably uh the setting the uh code of conduct they have the the way that they do performances the way the audience reacts to performances the first 45 minutes of this movie is just one scene it's them performing for an audience and you get all the ins and outs of these characters, the dynamics, the power structures that are at play, how the fictional world that they're operating within works out, how their complete counterculture uh, troupe operates, who's doing what, how it all works, how the weapons work, how the costumes work, how the audience reacts to it, how the um, how the whole thing works. Like it's a full like I'm picturing maybe like 10, 50 minutes as it gets going. I was like, oh, it's a good introduction. I was like, oh, no, this is almost the first hour of the movie. <laughs> right. And I think. I think we're correct in that that is really heightened when you have a zombie apocalypse going on outside or um, in, you know, in the crazies, a town is, um, you know, accidentally contaminated with a, with a, a gas that makes everybody crazy or whatever. Like it, those are, those are in confined, it's in a confined world where catastrophe is happening and there's a limited amount of time. And this movie really is the same way. It's maybe what, like three or four days. Mm -hmm. um, it is a confined amount of time because it's, you know, it, they're doing one performance and then, Ed Harris and another troop member get arrested and they have a get got to go to their town and do another performance. And they're split up a little bit there, but then everybody kind of comes back together. So it, it's still a confined amount of time. You just don't have that like exterior, larger world, like severely closing in and threatening all of their lives to really kind yeah. of melt through to the end. But his but, structure is still solid and it's structured just like you would um, any of his other genre movies. Well, and they're being threatened by another apocalypse, which is the destruction of their community and their world. Thanks to greed and capitalism. Greed, capitalism, and maybe being a little bit too rigid. A little bit. A little bit. But. Um, Any final thoughts, Isaac? No, that's really good, actually. I'm not going to cap that um, or top that. So I'll, 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 I'll go with, I'll go with what, 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 what he said. Um, <laughs> check it out. It's weird. It may not quite land, um, but the bones are really strong. And I think they're really his strengths. And uh, you know what? I'll, I'll make the other. I mean, this is I sort of group him and Carpenter together in my head. And I think the other reason is that they are, you know, in the way that you're talking about, like the structure of the they, they structure their films perfectly, mm -hmm. even when it's not the best of what they do. It's just the best of their stuff. It's just like there's this solidness underneath 
um, like the character arcs are strong or the pacing right. is perfect or whatever it is. It's just yeah. like they hit it. And I think that's true with both of them. Because like um, we said, we've mentioned a few times, 140 some minutes long. I don't know what you would cut out of it. Sorry for Night Riders. Like it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's long. Sometimes a story takes a minute. You know, what are you going to do? It's not like there's a bunch of extra stuff. You're like, okay, we're well, we that side plot or like, no, it all, it all feeds together to create the whole, like if you take stuff out of it, like it's, other stuff's not going to work then. All right. So the non, the non horror Romero is in the books, Isaac, what have we got for the next one? We're straight going to my maybe favorite, second favorite movie of his. Uh, we're going to talk about Martin, which we talked about at the top. Um, it's his vampire movie. And, uh, it's, uh, it's not the easiest to get a hold of, but actually you can find it on YouTube for free. Yep. Um, it's fun. And I think that's functionally cause it's out of print in terms of like Blu-ray and, and DVD. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't really find it on streaming servers that much. It's very weird. Um, it's but really I it, fascinating though. It's um, fascinating. I think yeah. it might be really We'll, we'll talk about it, but it might be legitimately. I mean, I think he's got three or four movies that you could call to at least two masterpieces under his belt. And I think this might be a third. I would know too, if anybody out there that's listening to this is watching it before we get to the next episode. Um, I, I'm doing a class right now in the 60s, 70s, like the new Hollywood stuff. And I keep noting there are certain directors that I, I, I'm just not realizing operate outside of time and space to me. And I mentioned in the late 60s, the, this new Hollywood class that Kubrick is one of those to me. Like mm-hmm. he's doing amazing works of art on film that aren't necessarily like what's going on in the general culture. Like he's not trying to t- tap into the zeitgeist or something like that. So we mentioned Knight Rider. I think Romero is also one of those those filmmakers where I was like, wait, what year is that? Like I, his films just operate like outside of uh, time and space the way films normally do. And Knight Riders coming out the same year as Excalibur and Raiders of the Lost Ark, you're like, I it doesn't even feel like it's the same time period. Like that this movie was made the same time those movies were made. Uh, Martin, that's sorry, my, that's my long preface. Martin came out the same year that star Wars came out. So just keep that in mind as you're, as you're watching Martin. I didn't even think about that. Okay. Fair enough. I just, the, the, the context for it, I was just like, Oh, that's crazy. Well, so, well, that is it then for night riders. But before we sign off, be sure to uh, rate and review the show in whatever podcast app you are using. And if you are enjoying it, uh, maybe tell a friend or two, uh, pass it on. If you're trying to convince somebody else to watch night riders, hopefully we did a good job of, um, doing that. It took a few minutes, but, uh, that's our, that's our hard sell for you should watch night riders. We're also up and running on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the usual stuff. You can follow the links in the show notes to give us a follow the various social medias. And until next time, I'm Aaron. And I'm Isaac, and uh, stay safe out there. The pandemic is still not over, and in fact is, has been in a more dangerous phase. And uh, this necro-political politi- uh, you know, political and social system doesn't seem to care nearly enough, or at least its internal contradictions are flaring to the degree to which it's, well, it's, it's pretty dangerous out there. I'm currently in a university that's opening up, and uh, there are safety measures, but like, we'll, we'll see how this goes, because they really just care about money. Take care of each other because nobody else is going to. I, oof, brutal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that seemed like the direction you were heading. Sort of, but yeah, we'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I we have to take care of each other as, as a collectivity and through class struggle primarily. I can get that off at any point before <laughs> this stuff. No, we, let's keep all this on there. Okay. Okay.